Well, we love Christmas time. Um, it's a happy, cheerful time. And I had to share something that recently um, has happened at our house. Um, we got this, oh, this was a while back though, that I'd gotten this picture uh, that says love is patient, love is kind, it has the whole verse on it. And I thought, well, where I was going to put it, just it didn't fit. It was too wide for that space. Then I thought, well, I'll put it in the bedroom. They say that verse at weddings all the time. And I thought, that'll work. And then I found the perfect spot for it. It's in our living room, right in front of my chair. <laughs> And the verse is, love is patient, love is kind. I'm starting to memorize it, but I'm afraid I, I, to say it by memory right now because I, I don't think I can make it all the way through. But it is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And I know that that is where it's supposed to be in front of my chair. So I'm reminded as we watch TV and J Dave may change the channel to a football game or something. Um, but anyway, God is good and he came, he is love. And that's why we're celebrating is the birth of him who is love. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, 
and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, 
they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that we can celebrate the birth of Jesus today. And Lord, we thank you for the great love that was displayed <clears throat> by you and by the person of Christ uh, in his coming to the earth uh, to become a man and to reveal to us who God is and to reveal to us in, in amazing ways how much you love us. Lord, uh, use this message uh, for your honor and for your glory. Give us eyes to see who Jesus truly is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So imagine what it must have been like for Mary and Joseph when they first laid eyes on the baby Jesus. Imagine what must have been going through their minds and through their hearts. He's so small. He's so beautiful. He's so handsome. He's truly a gift from God. And he's finally arrived. What timing. And the messages they received from the angel Gabriel were also running through their minds as well. Remember, the angel Gabriel appeared uh, to Mary. And in Luke 1, uh, it says, uh, the angel Gabriel said to her, you will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Imagine as she's holding the baby Jesus in her arms, she's thinking about and remembering what the angel had told her. And he went on and he said, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You, so, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. For nothing is impossible with God. And then the angel Gabriel also had appeared to Joseph in, in a dream. And in uh, Matthew chapter 1, um, the angel Gabriel said to Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so imagine if you were Mary and if you were Joseph and you were um, holding the baby Jesus and looking on his, his face, his countenance, you would be running, uh, remembering what, what the angel Gabriel had said to you about this baby that's now in your arms. What amazing thoughts must have been running through their minds. We have heard people looking at their infant children and thinking of the miracle of birth and recognizing reflections and resemblances of themselves and other family members as they peer upon their babies. Um, and we, as they gaze upon their little ones, they may say things like, how adorable, how precious this child is. And yet Mary and Joseph and the, and the shepherds, the angels and the wise men, they went beyond saying, how adorable Jesus is. Uh, they, they actually adored him. In other words, they worshiped him. They honored him 
as more than just a human being. Why? Because when they saw the baby Jesus, they saw more than an infant human who had hope. They saw God. They saw God's glory, as we read a little earlier in John chapter 1, verse 14. Glory in the, in the Greek means that which gives a proper opinion of someone or something. So God's glory provides us with a glimpse of, into the beauty of, of the baby Jesus, of his brilliance, of his radiance. God's glory is the sum of his character, of his attributes, and of his perfect ways. Glory is um, sometimes displayed as a bright and uh, expansive light. For example, when John says he saw his glory, he may have been referring to the time when Jesus was transfigured before them on the mountain, before James, John, and Peter. In other words, when they saw Jesus transfigured, they saw him in his glory. Matthew 17, 2 says, there he was transfigured before, the, before them. His face shone, shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Luke 9, 29 says about the transfiguration, as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says about Jesus, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In the Gospel of John, glory is linked to Jesus' miracles. You can see it, for example, in John 2, 11, when Jesus um, changes the water into wine miraculously. You can see it uh, when Jesus is preparing uh, to raise Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Jesus' miracles are linked to God's glory. And Jesus' glory was supremely revealed to us through the cross. Um, when Judas left the upper room uh, to go and betray Jesus, in John chapter 13, verse 31, Jesus himself said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. In other words, the Son was being glorified because he was preparing to go to the cross to die for our sins and to bring about salvation through his name. So glory means that which gives a proper opinion of someone. Why did John, in chapter 1, verse 14 of John, and throughout his book, link Jesus with God's glory? And why did the characters that we read about in the Christmas story, in Luke chapter 2, the shepherds, the angels, Mary, Joseph, why did they link Jesus with God and his glory? Their opinion of him, even when he was an infant, was shaped and influenced by the messages of the Lord that came through the angel Gabriel, that came uh, through scripture prophecies, that came through the angelic host as they were a chorus proclaiming the glory of God to the shepherds, singing in the skies above them. Each of these characters believed the messages being shared about the baby Jesus in the manger was true, that they were truly transforming messages, significant. Luke 2.9 says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, 
and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. There, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws, lying in a manger. Notice how the angel describes the baby Jesus. He describes him as a savior who has been born to you. He describes him, he says specifically, he is Christ, the Lord. In other words, he's not only the savior, but he's Christ. He's the Messiah, the anointed one that was prophesied in the Old Testament that would come, who would set up his kingdom. And notice he doesn't just call him Christ, referring to Messiah, but he calls him the Christ the Lord. He's designating him as God. Um, and so that's the angel speaking. Uh, the angels choir uh, in verse 13 and 14 uh, says this, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. The angel's choir is singing great glory to God at the announcement of this baby boy who's lying in a manger, wrapped in clothes. Why? Because he is Savior, because he is the Messiah, the Christ, and because he is the Lord. Um, he is God himself. This is significant, that the angels are worshiping over this announcement. Uh, the angels worship the Lord. Um, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, uh, John the Apostle, who wrote the Gospel of John, John is talking, uh, an angel is talking to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. And um, verse 10 says, at this, I, John, fell at his feet to worship him, to worship the angel. But he, the angel, said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The, angel, the angels don't worship um, don't receive worship from others. They, um, this angel that was talking with John told him uh, and actually took time to correct John, stop worshiping me. Don't worship me, worship God. Worship him alone. Um, The angels worship the Lord. They do not receive worship from other people. Other people may try to worship them, but they would try to stop that from happening and redirect the worship to go to the Lord. He's the only one worthy of our worship. And so you have in Luke, in the Christmas story, the angels worshiping over the announcement of a savior being born, worshiping him because he's Christ the Lord, that he's God himself. And so they're singing great glory to the Lord. Um, then uh, in Luke 2, 15, uh, it says this, when the angels had left them, and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem 
and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Um, this is their, the angel's response to the hallelujah chorus of, of the angels. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's check out for ourselves and confirm the message that we've received from the angels. And notice what they say. Uh, they say that the Lord has told them this message. The message came through the angels, but it was from the Lord. And that is significant. They believe that God was speaking to them through the angels and directing them to go to the Savior, to this little child that had just been born in Bethlehem. And so they believed that the Lord was speaking to them and uh, they believed the enthusiasm of all the angels as well. Let's go and check it out ourselves. And so they, they wanted to experience for themselves the Savior. They wanted to see him with their own eyes. And, uh, and so they, they wanted to meet the, the Christ, the Lord, face to face. And that's what we should want to do as well. So in verse 16 and 17 of Luke 2, it continues, the story continues, says, so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. So when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. Yes, they saw for themselves that what the angels said was true. The sign that the angels had given them, you'll find a baby lying in a manger. He'll be wrapped in cloths. And they went and they actually saw that for themselves. And they also believed what they had been told about this child, that he's the Savior, that he is the Christ, that he is the Lord. And they left to go spread the good news about what they had seen and heard. This is significant for us. Um, this phrase, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. That's in the, we're in the same position as the shepherds. Now, we haven't been able to see for ourselves physically like they could see, but we're relying on the messages that we have read and the messages that we have heard from others about this child. And just like the, the shepherds went to spread the good news, we're encouraged to go spread that good news as well about what we have heard. Luke 2.18 continues, um, and it says, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. Verse 19 says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. In other words, she highly valued all these events, all the conversations, all the visits from the angels, from the shepherds, etc. cetera. Uh, she stored them up in her heart so that she could recall them and bring them back to her remembrance and ponder them in her heart, meditate deeply and reflect deeply upon the significance of these events about, the, about her own little son that she's holding in her arms. Um, that's something that we should be doing during this time of year too, is uh, we should highly treasure these events about the person of Jesus. And we should be valuing them and storing them up in our own lives so that we can think about them, 
how important they are, how precious they are, and the deep significance they should have, that these, these events should change the rest of our lives and how we relate to the Lord, how we relate to the baby Jesus. He's not just an infant human being. He's more than that. He's God in the flesh. And notice verse 20. It says, The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And isn't that amazing? Uh, the, these whole, all the, these events led to them continuing to glorify God, worship Him, and talk of Him, think of Him, serve Him, and build their lives around this particular event. In application, I want us to think about a few things. Uh, first of all, that Jesus and His glory is worth hearing about. The shepherds dropped what they were doing when they were in the fields tending the flock at night. They dropped what they were doing and they hurried off to see what God was up to in the city of Bethlehem. They went to go see the Savior for themselves. And we need to think about that. Uh, sometimes we get so busy with everyday life, including work, including recreation. We get so busy with everything going on that we don't take time to listen about Jesus, to hear about him, to go see him. And the shepherds dropped what they were doing in order to go be with the Savior and to greet him, to welcome him, to learn of him. And I want to encourage you to see the value of, of doing this in your own life, having personal devotions, of being in church, worshiping the Lord, uh, learning of him, hearing of him. Number two, Jesus and his glory is worth believing in. It's worth building your life around. They, the, the shepherds, listened to the stories about Jesus. They went and checked those stories out for themselves to make sure that they were as they had been told. They learned what they had been told was actually true, and they believed it in their hearts, and they began to talk about it. They began to spread that good news. They followed him and his teaching. They acted upon their faith in the Lord. And that's what we need to do in our lives. We need to believe him, to be convinced of his entrance into the world and his, uh, of the description of who he is, that he's not just another human being. He's Christ the Lord. Number three, Jesus and his glory is worthy of our praise. Jesus is a true object of worship. And he should capture our hearts and minds. Uh, we should adore him. We should honor him. Um, not just in coming uh, to church, on Sunday and singing publicly, but we should honor him and worship him in the way we live our lives. Uh, our whole life could be uh, an expression of our adoration of the Lord Jesus by the way we live. And then number four, Jesus in his glory is worth spreading the good news to others. We should want to be like the shepherds uh, to tell family, friends, uh, neighbors, co-workers, acquaintances about this Savior who has been born to us, about Christ the Lord, and offer them uh, the joy 
the peace that comes in knowing him, worshiping him, serving him, following him. Uh, we should want to invite others uh, to know him like we are coming to know him. I'd like to end by sharing um, a story from Max Lucado's book in the, in the Manger, which originally came out in his book, God Came Near. And uh, the particular chapter is titled, um, The Face of the Infant God. Were someone to chance upon the sheep stable on the outskirts of Bethlehem that morning, what a peculiar scene they would behold. The stable stinks, as all stables do. The stench of urine, dung, and sheep reeks pungently in the air. The ground is hard, the hay scarce. Cobwebs cling to the ceiling, and a mouse scurries across the dirt floor. A more lowly place of birth could not exist. Off to one side, a group of shepherds sit silently on the floor, perhaps perplexed, perhaps in awe, no doubt in amazement. Their night watch had been interrupted by an explosion of light from heaven and a symphony of angels. God goes to those who have time to hear him. So on this night, he went to simple shepherds. Near, near the young mother sits the weary father. If anyone is dozing, he is. He can't remember the last time he sat down. And now that Mary and the baby are comfortable, he leans against the wall of the stable and feels his eyes grow heavy. The mystery of the event puzzles him. But he hasn't the energy to wrestle with questions. What's important is that the baby is fine and that Mary is safe. As sheep com comes, no, as sleep comes, he remembers the name the angel told him to use, Jesus. Wide awake is Mary. My, how young she looks. Her head rests on the soft leather of Joseph's saddle. The pain has been eclipsed by wonder. She looks into the face of her baby, her son, her Lord, his majesty. At this point in history, the human being who best understands who God is and what he's doing is a teenage girl in a smelly stable. She can't take her eyes off him. Somehow Mary knows she is holding God. So, this is he. She remembers the words of the angel. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. Luke 1.33. He looks like anything but a king. His face is prunish and red. His cry, though strong and healthy, is still helpless and piercing. Uh, as of a baby. And he is absolutely dependent upon Mary for his well-being. Majesty in the midst of the mundane. Holiness in the filth of, a sh of sheep manure and sweat. Divinity entering the world on the floor of a stable, through the womb of a teenager, and in the presence of a carpenter. She touches the face of the infant God. How long was your journey? The baby had overlooked the universe. These rags keeping him warm were the robes of eternity. His golden throne room had been abandoned in favor of a dirty sheep pen. And worshiping angels had been replaced with kind but bewildered shepherds. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to spend these moments reading your word and thinking 
of their significance for our lives. And Father, I pray that uh, at this time of Christmas, that you would speak into our hearts and lives in ways similar to the way that you did with Mary and Joseph, with the shepherds at the original first Christmas. Lord, help us to ponder these things, treasure them up and ponder them in our own heart like Mary did. Lord, help us to be like the shepherds who believed, who worshiped, and who spread the good news. Be with us today and the rest of uh, this special time of the year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.